Um, today's discussion is going to be on the jurisdiction of the United States. So if you're being charged federally by the FBI or some government agency, IRS alleged government agency, that you can understand some arguments to make to defend yourself and claim that the United States has no jurisdiction to bring you into court because there's going to be a, some basis for uh, establishing jurisdiction over you and they're probably not going to explain it very well. But you have a right to challenge jurisdiction and so let's say you get charged with having a couple of uh, pounds of uh, pot marijuana in your trunk or something like that and it's a federal charge. You want to be able to state that the United States District Court has no jurisdiction over you to bring you up on charges. So at the beginning of this discussion I'm going to break it up into different categories and the first category I'm going to discuss is law and what that is, the definitions, citizen and what that is, the definitions, what's the subject, what's the term United States mean because it's a word term word of art it's not really what most people think it means it's not the states united when the United States is bringing charges against you and then um, what's the delegated power that there that the federal government is operating off of uh, number four would be the a sovereignty and who has it and who doesn't and what is a Republican form of government number five uh, will include more definitions of what the United States of America is the United States what the term means and show case law describing the legislative uh, exclusive legislative and jurisdiction that is acquired that needs to be acquired by the federal government before they can charge you. And then number six will be some interesting cases on the um, municipal corporation that formed Washington DC in 1871. It really doesn't have any effect on you, but some people think it does. And then number seven, um, number seven in our discussion will be why if there is no jurisdiction and they cannot prove that there is jurisdiction that it becomes a fraud and a nullity any decision where you've been convicted in a case where there's no jurisdiction is a nullity it's void and I'm going to show the evidence of that so let's dive into our show thank you very much for watching okay here's from Black's Law 4th page 1028 law that which is laid down, obtained, or established. A rule or method according to which phenomenon or actions coexist and follow each other. That which must be obeyed and followed by citizens. Get that? Citizens, subject to sanctions or legal consequences. Well, why must it be laid down? You see, <laughs> what about unwritten law? There's an unwritten law, you know, mama's law, that you can't hit your, your friends, you can't hit other people, you can't steal their stuff. Black's Law would like you to believe that it has to be written for you to have to abide by it. And yet, you know, this country was founded on English common law, and English common law, by and large, for a huge extent of it, is unwritten law. The statute, an act of the legislature declaring, commanding, or prohibiting something right the written will of the legislature the word is used in to designate the written law in contradistinction to the unwritten law so at least we're recognizing there is such a thing as unwritten okay this is a paper written by the Berkeley University of Berkeley it's a very good description of common law versus civil law common law or civil law the common law tradition emerged in England during the Middle Ages and was adopt, was applied within British colonies across continents. The civil law tradition developed in continental Europe at the same time and was applied in the colonies of European imperial powers such as Spain and Portugal. Our legal system, which is based on English common law, our system is common law. The most fundamental ways in which they 
in which they diverged was in the establishments of judicial decisions as the basis of common law and legislative decisions as the basis of civil law. We're wrong. Common law is generally uncodified, uncodified, okay? No code, uncodified. This means that there is no comprehensive compilation of legal rules and statutes. Civil law, in contrast, is codified. So whenever you see a whole bunch of codes, you're dealing with civil law, not common law. Substantive law establishes which acts are subject to criminal and civil prosecution. Substantive law is written law. Same article. Historical development of civil law. The term civil law derives from the Latin ius civili, the law applicable to all Roman civis or citizens. Okay, so it, is, it applies to citizens. Of legal scholars throughout Europe adopted the principles of ancient Roman law in the corpus iuris civilis to contemporary needs. The birth and evolution of the medieval civil law tradition based on Roman law was thus integral to European legal development. So you get it? Codes are Roman civil law. Our system of law is from English common law, not from Rome. France's civil code, known as the Napoleonic Code of 1804, such codes shaped by the Roman law tradition are the models of today's civil law system. Okay, this is the law of the land. This is the definition, law of the land. Everything which may pass under the form of an enactment is not the law of the land. Get it? Statutes are enactments, not the law of the land. When first used in Magna Carta, the phrase probably meant the established law of the kingdom, in opposition to the civil or Roman law. So civil and Roman law are not law of the land. This Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made, of which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land. It means due process of law warranted by the Constitution, by the common law adopted by the Constitution, or by statutes passed in pursuance of the Constitution. Okay, and then from Black's Law 4th, 1968. Sovereign, a person, body, or state in which independent and supreme authority is vested. A chief ruler with supreme power, a king or other ruler with limited power. Citizen, and what that is, the definitions. Law, what is a citizen? Citizenship is membership in a political society which implies the reciprocal obligations as compensations for each other of a duty of allegiance on the part of the member and a duty of protection on the part of the society. Luria versus United States, that's a Supreme Court decision, 231 U.S. 9 in 1913. No duty to protect by the state. These are court cases. A state's failure to protect an individual against private violence generally does not constitute a violation of the Due Process Clause because the clause imposes no duty on the state to provide members of the general public with adequate protective services. De DeShaney versus Winnebago, 49 U.S. 189, Supreme Court case from 1989. And that's from... Rehnquist's decision. So there's no duty to protect the citizen. So then there's no duty by the citizen to the state, is there? Because it's a reciprocal thing. And then this court case said, no duty to warn a victim of potential assault by dangerous prisoner being released from custody, where no continuing relationship between the state and the victim from the California court case. Police radio dispatcher delayed 10 minutes after alert before broadcasting burglary in progress held the city's not liable. By metaphysical refinement. What the hell does that mean? In examining our form of government, it might be correctly said that there is no such thing as a citizen of the United States. Yeah. 
because nobody's born in Washington, D.C., and that's the place where the United States is the United States, unless you're talking about the separate states. A citizen of any one of the states, now here we have capital S states, of the Union is held to be and called a citizen, lowercase c, of the United States, although technically and abstractly there is no such thing. There's no such thing as a citizen of the Okay, here we have Black's Law definition of allegiance from page 99, Black's Law 4th, 1968. Obligation of fidelity and obedience to government in consideration for protection that government gives. Then, uh, under the tie or ligament which binds the subject or citizen to the king or government. Right? Sovereignty. At the revolution, the sovereign sovereignty devolved on the people, and they are truly the sovereigns of the country, but they are sovereigns without subjects. Okay, I don't have any subjects, you don't have any subjects, and no man or woman in Congress has any subjects, because it's an impossibility. We're all equal. Instead of saying you're sovereign, just let's say we're all equal. There's no titles of nobility. Nobody is superior to you or me. Can't tell each other what to do. With none to govern, we can't govern anybody. None to govern but themselves. Georgia's Chisholm versus Georgia, 2 Dahl 419, this is a Supreme Court decision in 1793. Sovereignty itself is, of course, not subject to law, for it is the author and source of law. That's because the king made the law. He decreed the law, and the law could not apply to him, because he could just remove it. A sovereign is exempt from suit, not because of any formal conception or absolute theory, but on the logical and practical ground that there can be no legal right as against the authority that makes the law on which the right depends. And that was a U.S. Supreme Court decision, 205 U.S. 349 in 1907. And then, in common usage, the term person does not include the sovereign. And statutes employing the phrase are ordinarily construed to exclude it. Wilson versus Omaha Indian Tribe, 442 U.S. 653 in 1979. The very meaning of sovereignty is that the decree of the sovereign makes law. American Banana Company versus United Fruit. Okay, this is Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution for the United States of America. 17, Clause 17, to exercise... Congress shall have the right and power to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district not exceeding 10 miles square. Well, we know what that is. That's Washington, D.C. As may, by session of the particular states and the acceptance of Congress, become the seat of the government of the United States, Washington, D.C., and to exercise like authority over all places purchased by the consent of the legislature of the state in which the same shall be, for the erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings. So, there's only two spots in the Constitution that, and the Constitution is one of delegated powers, where the powers that are delegated to Congress are to write laws and pass laws, and those two spots are for Washington, D.C., and any property owned by the United States. But that would be the Virgin Islands, Guam, Puerto Rico, American Samoa, and it does not mean the several states of which, you know, 99% of the people live in. Here we have Article 4 of the United States Constitution. You know, the Constitution for the United States of America. Not the Constitution of the United States. Because that would be different, right? Uh, this is Federal State Relations, Section 3, in Paragraph 2. The Congress shall have the power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the United States, and nothing in this Constitution shall be so construed as to prejudice any claims of the United States or any particular state. So, the only authority Congress has is to make rules and regulations for the property, the territories that are owned by the United States. 
course, we haven't defined what the United States is. The question is not what power the federal government ought to have, but what powers in fact have been given by the people. The Federal Union is a government of delegated powers. You know, men and women delegated powers to the government. At that point, the government can't go past what is written as their authority to do something. Nor can they give any authority to do anything that they've received to somebody else. Entomology. Webster's Revised Unabridged Dictionary. That's where did this the word jurisdiction come from. Jus, juris, right, and law. That's what jur means, law. And dictio, a saying, or diction, you know, spoken. Speaking, jurisdiction. Webster's Revised Unabridged Dictionary, jurisdiction, sphere of authority, the limits within which any particular power may be exercised, or within which a government and or a court has authority and jurisdiction the authority of a sovereign power to govern or legislate the right of making or enforcing laws the power or the right of exercising authority generally speaking within any state of this union the preservation of the peace and protection of the person are the functions of the state government small small case state and are no part of the primary duty, at least of the nation. The laws of Congress respect to those matters do not extend into the territory limits of the states, but have force only in the District of Columbia and other places that are within the exclusive jurisdiction of the national government. Caja versus United States, Supreme Court 152 U.S. 211. Alexander Hamilton was a man who was there at the time the Constitution was enacted and he was one of the original framers of the Constitution. I don't think anybody other than the 50 guys that were there at the time would know better what the intention of the Constitution was than those guys. He wrote an article in the Federalist Papers, title number 17, wherein he flat out came out and said, the federal government has no authority to, to prosecute for criminal or civil action in a state. Chief Justice Rehnquist once said that the people that are in prison are there voluntarily. Now I'm sure that was to help him sleep at night so that because he didn't want to be accused of harming anybody but I'm sure everybody that was there on a victimless cr crime like Erwin Schiff didn't really feel that they were there voluntarily and with all of the shenanigans that goes on in court we know that's not true. But anyway voluntarily as in most people convict themselves with their own words you'll go into court and say yeah I went through this uh, stop sign but I had a good reason I don't care guilty you had just admitted your guilt there was no discussion about whether you were actually driving a motor vehicle or you were a driver or engaged in any commercial activity that could be regulated or you broke any law just the presumption that you admitted that you were guilty and therefore pay the fine. So if you're going to admit that you're a United States citizen when you're asked, then obviously that is a detriment to you because I'm not a United States citizen. And I've got a court case that shows one, uh, the Supreme Court feels that they have the right to um, prosecute people and that the United States has jurisdiction over them based on the fact that they're US citizens, not based on the fact that they own the land and have exclusive legislative authority over that land. During the time it remains a territory, Congress may legislate over it within the scope of its constitutional powers in relation to citizens of the United States and may establish a territorial government. I'm sorry, but just because they're citizens of the United States doesn't give the power of Congress to legislate over anything. It has to own the property. Okay, what is the United States? And these are just some definitions given. 28 U.S.C. 302 definitions, as used in this chapter, United States means a federal corporation. And you thought it was a trust wherein it was protecting your rights instead of a corporation out for profit and designed to protect the guilty. An agency, department, commission, board, or other 
entity of the United States or an instrumentality of the United States. What does the word of mean? You know, grammatically of means it derives from. Okay, definitions of 26 U.S.C. 7701, that's the tax code. Person, the term person, shall be construed to mean and include an individual, a trust, a state, partnership, association, company, or corporation. Okay, a justum generis, of the same kind, class, or nature, in the construction of laws, wills, and other instruments, the adjustum generis rule is that where general words follow an enumeration of persons or things by words of a particular and specific meaning, such general words are not to be construed in their widest extent, but are to be held or applying only to persons or things of the same general kind or class as those specifically mentioned. Okay, we have the definition of ejustum generis, of the same kind, in construction of laws, wills, and other instruments when certain things are enumerated, and then a phrase is used which might be construed to include other things, it is generally confined to things ejustum generis, as where an act provided that a writ of quorento might issue against persons who would usurp, quote, the offices of mayors, bailiffs, port reeves, and other offices within the cities, towns, and corporate boroughs and places within Great Britain, it was held that other offices meant offices ejustum generis, and that the word places signified places of the same kind, that is, that the offices might be corporate offices, and the places might be corporate places. So you see, if they're all the same kind of thing, then everything in that group is the same kind of thing. And that's from Bouvier's 1856. Bouvier's Law Dictionary. United States person, the term United States person means a citizen or resident of the United States. And then when you look at the word individual, right, as used here, individual, in 5 U.S.C., the term individual means a citizen of the United States. So why don't we just call it a citizen of the United States, a trust, and a state. Of course, I'm going to say a citizen of the United States is a person, and a person is a fictional thing. Then we have 28 U.S.C. Subchapter C, 3121 definition, state, United States, and citizen. For the purposes of this chapter, state, capital S, state. The term capital S, state, includes, that means it excludes everything else, the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, Guam, and American Samoa. That's the federal zone. The federal zone is everything that's owned by the United States and under its exclusive jurisdiction. The right to pass laws. Article 4, or Section 3 1. New states may be admitted by Congress into this union. So, unless there are two, United States, the term United States, when used in a geographical sense, includes the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, Guam, and American Samoa. Then we get down to includes, inclusio unius est exclusive altruist. The inclusion of one is the exclusion of another. The certain de de designation of one person is an absolute exclusion of all others, and that's from Black's Law Fourth for the definition of includes. Okay. Exclusive legislation is consistent only with exclusive jurisdiction exclusive legislation, the right to legislate acts, is consistent only with exclusive jurisdiction. You have to have jurisdiction over the area to be able to write law. That was Surplus Trading Company. And then we have, it is not unusual for the United States to own within a state lands which are set apart and used for public purposes. State, such ownership and use without more, do not withdraw the lands from the jurisdiction of the state. The lands remain part of the territory and within the operation of her laws, save that the latter cannot affect the t title of the United States or embarrass it in using the lands or interfere with the right of disposal. 
Clause 17 governs the cases where the United States acquires lands with the consent of the legislature of the state for the purposes there described. If lands are otherwise acquired and jurisdiction is ceded by the state to, to the United States, the terms of the session to the the terms of the session to the extent that they may lawfully be prescribed that is consistent with the carrying out of the purpose of the acquisition determine the extent of federal jurisdiction that's from a supreme court case james v dravo Contra contracting company 302 us 134 1937 california revenue and taxation code 6017 in this state or in the state means within the exterior limits of the state of california and includes all territory within these limits owned by or ceded to the United States of America. We think proper a proper examination of this subject will show that the United States never held any municipal sovereignty, jurisdiction, or right of soil in and to the territory which Alabama or any of the new states were formed, except for temporary purposes and to execute the trusts created by the acts of the Virginia and Georgia legislatures and the deeds of session executed by them to the United States and the trust created by the treaty with the French Republic of the 30th of April 1803 ceding Louisiana that would be the Louisiana Purchase Pollard's Lisi versus Hagen Supreme Court decision 44 U.S. 212 in 1845 the question under the act of October 9th 1940 the government of the United States acquired no jurisdiction to prosecute and punish for rape committed on land acquired by the United States within a state after the date of the act where jurisdiction exclusive or partial over the area had not been accepted by the United States in the manner which the act prescribes. The legislation followed our decisions in James v. Dravo, which we've already seen. These cases arose from controversies con concerning the relation of federal and state powers over government property. The government had obtained no jurisdiction at all or a partial jurisdiction or exclusive jurisdiction. Question number two, had the District Court of the Western District of Louisiana jurisdiction on the facts above set out to try and sentence the appellants for the offense of rape committed within the bounds of Camp Claiborne, obviously a military base, on May 10th, 1942? Our answer is certified not quite to certified question number one is yes, and to question number two is no. It's so ordered. And that's from the Supreme Court 319 U.S. 312 in 1943, Adams versus United States. So they're saying the federal court had no jurisdiction to hear a rape case committed on a military base. How interesting. So here we have, are the locks and dams in the instant case needful buildings within the purview of Clause 17? The state contends they are not. If the clause were construed according to the rules of justum generis, it could be plausibly contended that needful buildings are those of the same fort as sort as forts, magazines, arsenals, and dockyards. That is structures for military purposes. That's pretty much it. Because other than the defense of the nation, what right does the federal government have to do anything in a state? And it may be that. It may be that the thought of such strongholds was uppermost in the minds of the framers. And that's from James V. Dravo, contracting, 302 U.S. 134. Pre Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure, Rule 54, Application and Exception. C. Act of Congress includes, I mean, geez, it excludes everything else, any act of Congress locally applicable to and in force in the District of Columbia in Puerto Rico, in a territory, or in an insular possession. Once again, the federal zone. Kentucky's consent to this acquisition gave the United States power to exercise exclusive jurisdiction within the area. A change of municipal boundaries did not interfere in the least with the jurisdiction of the United States within the area. So what did they say there? They, they granted exclusive jurisdiction, right? The fiction of a state within a state can have no validity to prevent the state from exercising its power over the federal area within the boundary so long as there is no interference with the jurisdiction asserted by the federal government. The sovereign's rights in this 
dual relationship are not antagonistic, and that's from Supreme Court Howard versus Commissioners, 344 U.S. 624, 1953. What's clear there is they're saying that they granted jurisdiction. It's from the 41st Congress, Session 3, 1871. Chapter, what looks like uh, 62, an act to provide a government for the District of Columbia. Be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives, the United States of America, in Congress assembled, that all that part of the territory of the United States included within the limits of the District of Columbia be, and the same is hereby created into a government by the name of District of Columbia which will be a body corporate for municipal purposes. It's a municipal corporation. The United States is different from the municipal corporation, D.C. There, the support appointment has long been since given way to annual lump sum appropriations, which have been far less than the 40% provided by the Apportionment Act. Moreover, appropriations by Congress for the District of Columbia municipal government are not gifts but as traditionally understood are in compensation for valuable benefits received by the federal government from the municipality. Right there it's telling you that even though Congress has the right to legislate law there, they created a municipal corporation in 1871 to run the District of Columbia and they're two separate things. All important established and activities of the municipal government require congressional sanction. Every building, including those of the police, fire departments, every fund for support of those departments, and other fate, fulfilling of the various needs of the municipality. Yet, in a legal sense, they are not instrumentalities of the federal government, but are under direct ownership and control of the District of Columbia, a municipal corporation. See Act of June 11, 1878. The overall control by Congress of the federal district as the seat of the national government, U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, cl Clause 17, does not affect the distinct identity of the District of Columbia as a municipal corporation. And that's from Wham versus United States, 180F, 2nd, 38, Court of Appeals, District of Columbia, in 1950. A part of the act was repealed by Congress February 17, 1873. The 23rd session and clauses 20 and 35 of the 21st section, clause 16 and 21 of the section as amended were repealed and modified in 1876. Section 1, that all part of the territory of the United States included within the limits of the District of Columbia be and the same is hereby created into a government by the name of the District of Columbia, by which name it is hereby constituted a body corporate for municipal purposes. And then for all those that want to know why their constitutional rights aren't upheld in the United States District Court, U.S. District Courts are not Article III Courts. The United States District Court is not a true United States Court established under Article III, which is the judiciary of the Constitution to administer the judicial power of the United States therein conveyed. It is created by virtue of the sovereign congressional faculty granted under Article 4, Section 3 of that in instrument of making all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory belonging to the United States. The resemblance of the jurisdiction to that of a true United States courts in offering an opportunity to non-residents of resorting to a tribunal not subject to local influence does not change its character as a mere territorial court. And that's from Supreme Court Balzac versus Puerto Rico, 258 U.S. 298. Okay, jurisdiction is required. Void judgment for impeachment of record. No jurisdiction. Code of Civil Procedure in California, 1916, grounds for impeaching judgment. Any judicial record may be impeached by evidence of a want of jurisdiction in the court or judicial officer, of collusion between the parties, or of fraud in the party offering the record in respect to the proceedings. Waiver of Jurisdiction, Service of Process. 
California Code of Civil Procedure 41810, Notice of Motion to Quash or Stay or Dismiss Action, Failure to Make a Motion under this section at the time of filing a demur or a motion to strike constitutes a waiver of the issues of lack of personal jurisdiction, inadequacy of process, inadequacy of service of process, inconvenient form, and delay in prosecution. How can you waive something without knowingly doing it? You can't waive anything without knowingly doing it. That's an example of the bar fraud telling you something when it's just particularly not true. Requirement to show facts, not alleged jurisdiction standing. Although neither party raises the issue here, we are required to address the issue even if the courts below have not passed on it. See Jenkins versus Mick. Keithen, and even if the parties fail to raise the issue before, before us, the federal courts are under an independent obligation to examine their own jurisdiction and standing. It is perhaps the best, the most important of the jurisdictional doctrines. Standing is perhaps the most important of the jurisdictional doctrines. Go Allen versus Wright, 468, U.S. 737, from 19. 84 Supreme Court decision. It is a long settled principle that standing cannot be inf inferred argumentatively from averments in the pleadings, but rather must affirmatively appear in the record. Facts supporting Article 3. Article 3 jurisdiction must appear affirmatively from the record. And it's the burden of the party who seeks the exercise of jurisdiction in his favor. In other words, if the United States of America is suing you, it's their burden to prove they have standing a personal injury or loss. Clearly to allege facts demonstrating that he is a proper party to invoke judicial resolution of the dispute. Thus, petitioners in this case must allege facts essential to show jurisdiction. If they fail to make the necessary allegations, they have no standing. That's a McNutt, Supra, 298 U.S. at, at 189, and that's where that's from. And this was FWPBS versus the City of Dallas, 493 U.S. 215 in 1990, a Supreme Court case. Then we have, in, consideration, in considering the question raised by this appeal, the first and most important is that of jurisdiction in the court over the defendant. If the court has no jurisdiction, then of course the judgment is a nullity. It doesn't matter if you were convicted of being guilty. If they didn't have jurisdiction, the guilty judgment is a nullity. Section 23 of Chapter 95, one and a half of the Illinois Revised Statute Codes, provides for service upon the Secretary of State where the defendant is a non-resident and that the use of the highway with a motor vehicle by such non-resident constitutes the Secretary of State as his attorney in fact for service. Rutherford versus Bentz, Illinois Appellate Court in 1952. Treason. We have no more right to decline the exercise of jurisdiction which is given than to usurp that which is not given. The one or the other would be treason to the Constitution. And that's from Justice Marshall and Cohen's versus Virginia in 1821, verified from United States versus Will, 449 U.S. 200 in 1980, where they quoted that. Jurisdiction of the court challenged. If the court of a state had jurisdiction of a matter, its decision would be conclusive. But this court cannot yield assent to the proposition that the jurisdiction of a state court cannot be questioned, where its proceedings were brought collaterally before the Circuit Court of the United States. Where a court has jurisdiction, it has a right to decide any question which occurs in the cause and whether its decision be correct or otherwise its judgments until reversed are regarded as binding in every other court. But if it act without authority, its judgments and orders are regarded as nullities. They are not voidable, but simply void and form no bar to a remedy sought in opposition to them. In other words, you can complain about them and have them reversed. It's not barring your, your right to complain. They constitute no justification and all persons concerned in ex executing such judgments or sentences are considered in law as trespassers 
In other words, when the bailiff takes you to jail on a judgment that's void, he's a trespasser on you. The jurisdiction of any court exercising exercising authority over a subject may be inquired into in every other court, whether the proceedings of the former are relied on and brought before the latter by a party claiming the benefit of such proceedings. Elliott versus Lisi of Pearsall, 26 U.S. 328, Supreme Court decision in 1828. Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. This is from Cornell University's off the web. Rule 17, plaintiff and defendant, capacity, public officers, real party and interest. Designation in general, an action must be prosecuted in the name of the real party and interest. Okay? I don't know if you want to make exceptions to that, but let's face it. Things that aren't real can't prosecute a case joinder of the real party in interest. The court may not dismiss an action for failure to prosecute in the name of the real party in interest until after an objection, because you're going to object to it, a reasonable time has been allowed for the real party in interest to ratify, join, and or be substituted into the action. So either you bring a man into the picture who's going to say that they suffered a personal injury or loss, or you don't have a case. In our standing, Article 3, that's out of the United States Constitution, Article 3, in order to meet the standing element of the case and controversy requirement, appellees must allege a personal injury that is particularized, concrete, and otherwise judicially cognizable. And that's from Reigns v. Byrd, 521 U.S. 811 in 1997. And then, standing represents a jurisdictional requirement which remains open to review at all stages of the litigation. So, even after you've been sentenced, the point is, you can challenge jurisdiction at any time, and standing is a jurisdictional requirement, which means you have to have a personal injury or loss. And then corpus delecti, in every criminal trial, not in some of them, in every criminal trial, the prosecution must prove the corpus delecti, or the body of the crime itself, i.e., the fact of injury, loss, or harm, and the existence of a criminal agency as its cause. And that's from People versus Alvarez, 